All right, good morning. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us in our introduction to Microsoft Dynamics NEV for Government Contractors, which is presented by PVBS. Today we'll be providing an overview of Microsoft Dynamics NAV for Government Contractors, which is a uh, fully integrated business management solution. And today's presentation, we're going to include um, a little overview of the executive dashboards, also the fully integrated time, web time and expense system, uh, project setup, which also includes billing setup and managing funding. We'll also try to get into invoicing and invoice formats and managing indirect rates. So uh, a little bit of housekeeping real quick. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and we will post this to our PVBS YouTube account later today. If you have any questions as we're going along, you can post those into the question section, and we will try to get to them. If we cannot be, get to your question, um, we'll have to contact you separately. We'll, we'll make sure that uh, we cover that for you. Also, later today, you'll receive an email invitation to take a post-webinar survey. Uh, we really appreciate any feedback that you can give us to make this a better learning tool for everyone. Uh, so please take a few minutes and answer some questions for us. We really appreciate that. Now, the agenda for today's webinar uh, includes a brief introduction about PVBS, and then we're going to jump right into the demonstration of the product. And again, if there's any questions or anything you want to see, uh, please post those, those into the question section, and we'll get to those as we can. Um, otherwise, we'll try to see what we'll say at the end and answer questions. So a little bit about Pleasant Valley Business Solutions, PVBS. Uh, we are a top-tier Microsoft Business Solutions partner serving only the government contracting market. Our headquarters are just outside Washington, D.C. in Reston, Virginia. Uh, it gives us a unique access and insight into the GovCon community. And as an experienced leader with over 12 years of success in the government contracting market and an intelligent innovator with Microsoft Systems, PVBS is a direct resource to both government contractors and the Microsoft community. Microsoft Dynamics NAV for Government Contractors, which we're going to cover today, is a uh, rich, robust accounting solution compliant with federal rules and regulations and provides complete integration and ease of use. Uh, again, PVBS is driven to develop excellence and providing the most comprehensive solution to our customers, and again, we'll see that today. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Paul Skirpsey, who is our VP of Sales and Marketing and one of the founders here at PVBS. Paul, welcome. All right. Thanks, Damon, and good afternoon to everybody again. We appreciate, or good morning, depending on where you are in the U.S. Uh, we appreciate you attending our webinar. I'm looking forward to uh, giving you a little uh, overview of the Microsoft Dynamics NAV solution and why so many government contractors are switching to the application. So I've been working in systems for, I guess, a little over 20 years now, and working specifically with government contractors uh, for the last 12 or 13. All right, so a little bit about Microsoft Dynamics NAV. So for folks that haven't heard of it before, it's been around for almost 25 years. I started working with the solution back in 1999, actually before Microsoft bought the company. And today, there's over 110,000 companies worldwide using it, which makes it the most widely used mid-market business software product in the world. So that's exciting for us and our clients to see the incredible adoption uh, that the solution has received, especially over the last 10 years, there's really been accelerated growth to the product. So a little bit about there's always a question that people have, which is, how does Microsoft go to market, and how does Pleasant Valley Business Solutions work with Microsoft? So we're actually a partner with them. Like Damon mentioned, we're a gold-certified partner. But we're also part of a couple key programs with them because of our vertical partnership strategy with them. So we are the go-to partner for, for government contractors for Microsoft. So in Microsoft, identifies government contractor opportunities. There's a handful of us in the U.S. that focus on that. Pleasant Valley is the number one partner there. So we've delivered the most new clients for Microsoft, and we've been the driver of the Microsoft Government Contractor Alliance. So we're a founding member of this organization for Microsoft to really continue to enhance the product and go after the marketplace related to government contractors. We've also done things to improve the product that we incorporate back into the base system that's actually certified by Microsoft. So this slide comes from Microsoft and kind of shows 
how PVBS integrates into the Microsoft ecosystem. We're their go-to partner for government contracting. All right, so that gives you a little bit of uh, background on the product, a little bit of background on our firm, and now I'm going to get into a demonstration. Like Damon mentioned, okay, like Damon mentioned, um, today's presentation is not going to be details on every aspect of the solution. It's meant as an overview. And if you'd like a more detailed presentation, you know, please feel free to reach out to your assigned account executive or Damon or myself, and we'll follow up with you after this demo if you have any questions that you post that we can't answer. So what we're going to do is you know, we're going to start off with a general overview of the product before we kind of go through that day in the life process of a government contractor and how they use the solution. What you're looking at right here is the home page for Microsoft Dynamics NAV for government contractors. I'm logged in as an accounting manager and I'm seeing some key activities that an accounting manager typically would be responsible for performing or overseeing. So things like expense reports that need to get processed or invoices that need to get created. And I can drill into these individual boxes to get into the detail. So here is the one expense report in my queue that's been submitted and it's already been approved and I can look at that whole approval process of who approved it and when they approved it. I can also pull up attachments to that expense report. But once I review it and accept it, I can turn it into a purchase invoice and pay it. And I'm going to show you the details of how expense reports are created, but one of the things that's great is you never have to rekey any of that data. So that data is entered one time from the initial setup of the project through collecting the expenses, reviewing and approving, and then finally turning it into a payable to pay the employee. So the idea of that home page is make it easy and streamlined for people to get to information, answer questions, and know what step in the process they're responsible for performing. You can also see my Outlook integrated into here, so I can see my inbox, calendar, and tasks. Each one of these sections has a little bit of a configuration option. So for employees that want to see more or less of their Outlook, they can decide how much detail to show. To give you an idea of <clears throat> the breadth of the application, I'm going to go to the department list so you can see all the modules, all fully integrated. So these are not um, elements that are developed in a vacuum. They're all developed together and all integrated in real time. So I can see information like financial management data. So everything from GL to cash management, AP, AR, and fixed assets, sales order processing, purchase order management. We have government contracts that perform a wide range of tasks. So one of them, some of them also have to warehouse and manufacture products or resell products. So today's presentation is going to be more focused on those companies that are project-based. So they're providing professional services to the government. But we've got a blend of clients that can either be straight professional services, professional services and engineering, sometimes it's manufacturing, and then also reselling of products. So really a blend of companies that use the application. Resource planning, HR, and payroll. So those are the different components that are built inside the application. What you're going to see is there's reports within every one of these modules. So within project accounting, there's a series of reports for project-based companies. So everything from job status reports, which are like your project P&L, uh, utilization reporting, billings reports, funding reports. So the key reports you need to run your business all baked into the system. Also a series of financial reports. In addition to the reports built into the application, we can leverage the back-end database, which is Microsoft SQL Server, and we built out a series of data cubes with dashboards associated with them. So these dashboards, both on the project side, the product side, and the financial side. So on the project side, I can look at a project income statement, look at that by project or task, a burn rate report, labor analysis. So if I just drill into these, what you'll see is, in this case, this is hours by labor category. And you can see it trended up top. That project spend report is showing me for any particular project that I choose. And you can choose also multiple projects. So if 
you are an individual that manages a program that's made up of four projects, you can select that group of projects here and also, also multiple task orders. And then what it's showing is for that range that I selected, what is the revenue, all of your operating expenses, including indirects, net income or loss, and also what was spent. That's how much of the funding got used in that period. And you can see when I look up in the formula bar, it's showing me there is no value in here. It's just showing that cube at a measure called total spent filtered by the different filters I've set, project, task, and period. And then over to the right, it's showing me a little funding status. So based on my average burn rate over the last three months, the system's going to calculate how many months of funding are left in the tank for me. So in this case, I've got 9.5 months of funding projected if we continue at the same burn rate on the project. So not only is this a system to perform the transactional side, also run the reports from an operational side, but then dashboards for whether it's the executive team or your operations organization to get a high-level picture of performance of projects, people, and also finances. So this is the series of project views, and then there's also a series of financial views. So I'll go into the financial view, <clears throat> and what you're seeing here is a business overview. So it's a trend of my revenue, profit, and AR. Balance sheet with key metrics giving me overall idea of um, the two main measures of performance of my business. Uh, on the income statement side, you're seeing details regarding quarterly performance, also current period and year-to-date performance, cash flow, and then different indirect rate views. So for clients that have cost reimbursable contracts, a big component of what finance does is to make sure that you're maximizing uh, your return by keeping your rates in line with you know what you've defined as your provisional rates and then also managing any type of rate adjustment as needed. So you can see for my demo system I've got a fringe overhead GNA subcontract material handling pool and you can see how my rates are performing over time provisional versus actual and the trend of that information. The third piece to the puzzle is the time, expense, and requisition system, which is just a straight browser-based component of the solution. So everything from entering that time and expenses, the approval of those documents, and also entering requisitions. So we'll go in a little bit into that process to enter time and expenses. Um, but the, the key thing to know here is all fully integrated, all within uh, that one SQL Server database. I guess one thing I did leave out on the reporting side, and I guess it's appropriate because uh, April 30th, we're just a couple months away from the June deadline for uh, submission of your incurred cost submission. We've got uh, the ICE model, schedules A through H, all built out. So this data is getting fed, same idea, from that data cube and data inside Dynamics NAV. So it actually will build your schedules for you. So if you think about the amount of time you spend potentially to put together your incurred cost submission, uh, something that can help you to automate a portion of that. And this is something that we're continuing to build on um, as we add the other schedules in. So those are the pieces uh, to what we're going to be showing today. And now I'm going to uh, hop back into the accounting system and talk a little bit about setting up projects. So we're going to go from project setup through collecting of time and expenses, uh, and then we'll go through you know, your, some of your month-end processes, including your indirect rates and billing. So um, one quick thing from about the home page, we talked a little bit about some of the other boxes here. Um, it is configurable, so end users can do your own configuration, but there's also role-based security. So people see the the capabilities of the system, they worry about others, you know, people in the organization who can get access to data. And how it works is there's also role-based security. So you can define, if I'm an AP clerk, maybe I can only see certain elements of the system. I can't see salary data and things like that. There's predefined roles, but they can also be tailored to your unique requirements. 
So for my home page, I've got also a list of jobs that I'm managing. So here's the four that I go into in most every demo. But in the demo system, you can see you know, a full list of jobs that are available to you. Uh, we'll go back to that home page. And from either spot, I can get into one of those jobs by just double-clicking it. So that launches that job setup screen. And now this is the place where I'd actually go to set up a new project or job um, and then manage all the elements related to billing, revenue, um, and funding on that particular job. So on the main tab or general tab, you can see information about this particular record, so the internal job number, description of the work, who is the client you're doing the work for. So anytime you see this little carrot down, it means I'm pulling from a list. So when I selected this particular customer, it filled in all the relevant fields related to that customer. If I had multiple contacts of this customer, I could select who is the main technical contact for this project. So I was going to select that from the list. And then you can see from the contract tab, I can also have information regarding um, the payment office, or I, I should say the contracting office or the payment office for this particular project. I can see what type of client it is. So part of that incurred cost submission, you need to identify you know, your commercial work versus federal, state, and local government. I would just select who is the type of client on this. Who is the project manager? What type of contract it is? So whether it's cost plus fixed fee, cost plus award fee, incentive fee, firm fixed price, et cetera, I'm going to select from my list. The period of performance for this work, any type of certification codes, you know, is there an is it FCA related contract, um, information about the timesheet side of it. So this is general information that I'm filling out that's going to be related to you know, each of the task orders underneath of it. Um, or at the task order level, I can override some of these fields, and I'll show you how you do that. On the posting tab, this is more of the financial data related to this. So you're looking at information regarding revenue and billing. So you can have the system has predefined formulas, but there's also some configuration options there. So if you've got unique contract types, systems can support that. So some of the, the unique things the system supports, uh, hybrid type contracts. So if you have firm fixed price tasks mixed in with T&M tasks on a contract or cost reimbursable with firm fixed price, you can accommodate that through those unique billing formulas. Information, this one's a cost plus fixed fee. You can see information about the fee percent, any type of withholding on this project, also details regarding revenue recognition. When I go to the contracting tab, on the contracting tab, I mentioned some of the, the fields related to contacts. There's also a contract-related field. So this contract would be you know, if you had some type of IDIQ. So if you're on the Seaport E contract or you've got a GSA contract, you can select the primary contract vehicle the work is being performed under. So then when you look at those reports early, those dashboards, if you wanted to select all work under a certain contract vehicle, you could do that. So it makes it easier to report and find data. Speaking of reporting, over to the right, there's a status box which shows me some high-level information about this particular job. So I can see the overall contract value, again, how much of it's funded, information about labor hours, AR balance, et cetera. Any one of these fields that you see that's blue and it's got a line underneath of it, it means I can drill into it. So when I drill into the AR balance, it takes me into here are all of the open customer ledger entries against this particular project. So in this project, there's five open invoices. And you can see the original amount of the invoice, how much is remaining. So anyone that has a variance tells me that's been paid or something's been credited. So you can see this line right here for invoice number 68. When I drill into this remaining amount of 672, it shows me the initial invoice and this application of payment. So there's a $1,000 payment to that. If I wanted to know more details about that payment, I can hit Navigate. And that's going to show me all entries related to that particular payment. So when that payment was recorded, you can see that it had an entry, um, two entries to the general ledger, an entry to the customer ledger, and then also information regarding the bank ledger. And if I want to look at the details there, 
I can just click show. So in the bank ledger, it shows me that we received um, on January 25th $1,000. We put it into our Bank of America account. So it allows you to answer those questions that you might have on a transaction without having to go in and out of any of the modules. You can actually just drill down and drill across the system. So that's a high level uh, setup of the top level of the job, but for many there's additional detail to that particular job setup. So within the work breakdown structure, this is where you see the detail of how that project is set up. Within the structure, it's called the job WBS or work breakdown structure. This is going to show me information regarding the structure of this project. So you can see that I've got at the task at level one, um, I've identified that this is CLIN 1. And if you've got Akron, if it's funded by Akron, I can identify the Akron funding below it. I'm able to see the details of what is the total cumulative contract and funded value of any of these individual levels. These individual levels can also have different contract types. So when I'm on level one, if I look at the tax detail, it's showing me that potentially this one might not be cost plus 60. This could be a firm fixed price tax. So that's the whole idea of the hybrid contract. <clears throat> when I look at any of these fund, any of these levels, this funding is made up of potentially one or multiple modifications to that contract. So when I'm on the setup task and I look at the modification detail, it shows me the history of all the mods that have been made to this particular line. If I wanted to add another one, I can type it in, but I can also just, just hit F8. That copies the line above it. We'll just say this is mod number 11. If I hit T under the starting date, it's going to put today's date in for me, or I could just use the calendar to select from the date. And then I would just identify what is that impact on contract and funded values. Maybe it was a quarter of a million dollar change, and it's fully funded. Once I make this entry and I say OK, what you're going to see is that all of the associated levels get updated. So when I say accept this change, you're going to see the contract and funded value get updated here. So it just went to 4.3 and 4.1 million. And when I go back to that work breakdown structure and look at that individual setup task, you can see that now this shows 3.2 and just over $3 million. So you're able to track that detail to the funding. If you have any documents related to it, so you've got an email from the contracting officer, um, or <clears throat> you've got a PDF or Word document, you can actually take and drag and drop a document, place it against the record, and what it's going to do is it's going to put a link into SharePoint. So it's going to drop, take that file, drop it into SharePoint for you, and then make it available for others to see. So when you think about it, all of the information that's contained out, outside of the system that you would never put inside of it, you can now relate it to the application. So it makes it easier for people to find and share data. So that's a little bit about the work breakdown structure and how that operates. Once you've defined the overall structure, uh, now you're deciding who's working on the project. So there's a couple things to show is one, visibility controls. So whether a level is visible on a timesheet or not, visible on an expense report. So you could have certain tasks that time can be charged but no expenses to it. And then you can identify who can charge. So the idea of membership and then different approval hierarchies that you can define within the system. So it really gives you the flexibility to manage things in detail, but the setup facilitates it being done in a cost-effective manner. So once I've got that overall project set up, now some key things you might want to think about is the overall budget for it. So you've defined what's been funded. If I wanted to budget individual resources, this is where I would identify who's working on the project so I can add a resource to the budget, identify their hours, I can also budget any type of other direct costs, so materials, lodging, et cetera. There is two different ways to get data in to this budget screen. So one, I can just import. Other thing is I can enter into the cells and then also leverage this copy feature. So what copy allows me to do is 
once I enter a one month budget, so in this case I entered uh, labor for April, I can actually copy that labor plan for April and copy it out over subsequent months. What the system will do is look at the number of available hours for that particular resource in the month. So if I'm a full-time resource, it knows how many working days are in April, and it creates a ratio. So if this was a quarter of Andrew's time in April, and I copy it over the next six months, it's going to put a quarter in those subsequent months. So it'll actually look at how many working days are available. You can do a similar concept with your ODCs. ODCs are typically not as linear, um, so you, you can still use that copy feature, um, or you can hand key it. There's additionally uh, options for providing a percent increase. So on your labor costs, you could say that there's a percent increase on your people's anniversary date or on a particular effective date. So try to make it easy to enter data into the budget because you know, the process of entering budgets can be cumbersome, and also you might want to manage multiple budgets. So you can have as many budgets in here, so your baseline budget, maybe you create a, you know, a running budget for your ETC budget that you're adjusting each month. And that gives you that ability to report on things, budget versus actual, comparing to you know, several of those different budget formulas. So now I've, I've set up this main project to find a budget. Other things that you might be interested in doing is uh, defining funding limits um, and ceilings and also setting up alerts on the project. What alerts allow me to do is within any level of the WBS, I can compare what's been spent or billed to what's funded or budgeted. And then at a certain percent, trigger an email out. So whether it's going to the PM, the task manager, or you're just hand-keying email addresses in. And at each of these percent levels, it's going to trigger that email. So every day the process runs to see if you've reached this percent. If you have, send out an email to one of those individuals to let them know that that status has been hit. Just uh, one quick explanation. So I think that we just talked about budgets. People understand that. We just also mentioned funding. Billing makes sense. It's what you've actually posted for an invoice. Spent is a concept not everybody's familiar with. And what spent does is it looks at time that's been charged against projects and expenses that have been charged but haven't been billed yet. So this is going to look at prior to billing where are you at. So it's going to really provide you an update um, before month end. So it's giving you more real-time information against the project. So that's kind of a lot of details about project setup. I'm going to cover one more element of project setup before we next go to the time entry side. And the next thing I want to talk about on, on the project setup is I'm going to go to a different type of project. So we were mainly just talking about a cost type project. I want to talk a little bit about a time and material project and how that is a little bit different. So what you're going to see is on a T&M project, typically you're billing by labor category. So I'm taking individuals, assigning them to the project, and giving them a project labor category because this might be different than their corporate labor category code. Then I'm identifying what are the bill rates in the project. So when you have the combination of these two screens together, this is telling me what any individual person would bill. So if I want to look at all project managers assigned to this project, I'm going to go ahead and filter to that uh, value within the list so you can see Andrew, Kevin, and Billy are PMs in the project. Now if I go over to the right and I look at the bill rates by project, this is going to show me for project 2025, that's the one we're on, it automatically filters it down for me. And it's showing me the project management labor category, what the effective bill rate is. So right now in 2015, this labor category bills at 240 an hour. Here are the people that are charging to it. So it helps to you know, predefine things that reduce the, the number of decisions an employee makes when they enter their time, and it helps to automate that whole process. And you can see the other thing is there's effective dates in here. So my demo system, I've got these rates going out to 2032. So you know, if I've got a, a multi-year contract, I don't need to worry about updating those rates. 
anytime you're in any list or ledger, so I want to send the data to Excel, if I just hit Control E, or if I select the Send Excel function, this will actually take that data and put it into an Excel worksheet. So that data that was just showing locally on my machine, I can send it off to Excel. And now if I wanted to take that Excel data, you know, and maybe I want to add future years labor categories, I can do that. Copy the data right from an Excel, and then we'll go into Dynamics NAV and use the Paste feature. <clears throat> it still does all the validation. So it's going to still make sure that this is a valid labor category. In case I change something in my Excel worksheet, it's going to let me know if there's any error related to the project number, labor category, or effective date. So that's a little bit about setting up the project. Um, and now before we go to the time and expense side, uh, we're going to just put a little poll out there so we can get a gauge for the type of folks that are on the call today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn to you, Damon, if you want to go ahead and put up our first poll. Sure. Um, I guess uh, our first poll then would be, um, talked about this before, but what accounting system uh, is your company currently operating on? Uh, we have a few choices here on the QuickBooks. Uh, Dell Tech, Microsoft Dynamics, Procast, and others. Uh, a lot of folks on QuickBooks. Paul, oh, you see that? Yeah, so right now it shows 55% are on QuickBooks. Uh, we've got 30 on Dell Tech, and I guess they're still moving around a little bit. And we've got about 10% on Procast and about 10% on others. So a uh, nice mix of companies on the call today. That's great to see. All right, so uh, next thing we're going to is we're going to the time and expense side. So what's happened is once you set up that project, just a couple things. Maybe we'll, let's go back into NAV and just show a couple of these things. So just to highlight, we, we talked a little bit about period of performance. So this determines what is the length of time someone can charge or even see the charge codes. You can also restrict it down to the individual level. So even though the pop ends on you know, uh, 2020, maybe Damon can only see the charge codes for a month. So you can also restrict it at the employee level. And then we mentioned within the work breakdown structure the visibility side. So only codes that are checked as visible on timesheet are going to be visible when employees log into their timesheet. So they just see their projects um, for the period of time that they're assigned to them, and then they're going to only see them um, if that visibility is checked. So then what happens is just a couple high level things. One is, as an employee, uh, I can look at my current PTO balance. So accounting um, or some administration can define the PTO accrual method. And then what's going to happen is every, um, every period, you're going to run that timesheet accrual process. And then this will update how many available hours um, each employee has. So they're going to see the availability in the PTO um, codes you can define them. So whether you have just PTO, vacation, and sick, whatever it might be, those can be defined by you. Hey, Paul, we got a question came in. I think it's a good time okay. for this. Yep. Um, it, the question is, uh, can the time be, be input from external devices? I think they're talking about mobile. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and let you answer that. Yeah, so I guess the first thing is you can use a uh, – a tablet to enter time. And what we're doing on the mobile side is later this year there's going to be a mobile client um, that will be released that you can enter your time and expenses on a mobile phone. So that's in process. Uh, so you can enter it either via a browser or a tablet today. All right, so other things you can do is you can request time off. So this time off request function allows somebody to select the days that they need off. Um, description of why they need the time off and submit that. And then what's going to happen is it goes off to their timesheet approver. The timesheet approver can go ahead and either accept the time off, and if they do, it goes directly on the employee's timesheet. If they reject it, they can put a comment in there as to why they rejected it. Other things employees can do is identify their list of favorites. So what are the particular projects they charge to every timesheet period? They put them on their list, and then when they start a new timesheet, the system's going to automatically fill the codes in for them. 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the day that I worked. So yesterday, maybe I put eight hours against Project Kempster. I would just enter my hours. If I wanted to enter a comment in there, I can enter a comment. Say OK. Save it. That's what I'm going to do on a daily basis. So that's the process that employees are going to go through. Uh, once they've completed it, they would complete their timesheet for the timesheet period. They would click the Submit button. Oh, I didn't save it yet. So I'm going to go ahead and save the data. So now it's saying it successfully saved it. And now that Submit process would submit my time for the period, and it would send off um, a reminder to my approver to let them know that they need to approve that time off request or reject it. I'm going to go ahead and cancel it because we've got one more day in the timesheet period. And I can also see any of the comments that were made. And I can see my prior period timesheets. And you can see which ones, you know, as I hover over them, I can see you know, the hours that are in there, if it's been submitted or approved. Um, I can see the details of that. You can also perform timesheet corrections as needed. So if you have a prior period timesheet you need to make a correction to, you can run the correction wizard. And what that would do is create a correction entry that would go off for the whole approval process. All right, so that's a little bit about the timesheet side. Uh, now I'm going to go over and we're going to touch on the expense reports for a little bit and talk about, on the expense report side, how I can do the same type of thing um, in terms of entering expenses and processing expense reports. So to create an expense report, I would just go ahead and add a new expense report, put in the period of time that I traveled. So um, maybe last week I traveled from the 22nd and through the 24th. Description of travel, so we'll say uh, trip to uh, Orlando. If I received any advance, I could write that in, click Save. <clears throat> and now it's started my expense trip. So it's giving me the period that I traveled, description of when I traveled. Um, if I'm traveling based on per diem, there's a per diem wizard. So I can actually run through the per diem process so we'll just say that uh, this is Florida. The final destination was Orlando. And then what's the county? And I can either type in or I can use the drop down box, either one. So I guess there's only one county for Orlando, Orange County. Click Next. And then if this was a multi-leg trip, I would select the different legs that I took. In this case, we'll just say that I went to the one place. Select the particular project that it was associated with. Uh, any particular WBS code, so this was for travel, and then identify what code I want to use from a lodging perspective, and then for meals, we'll just say this is based on per diem. Click Next, and now it's giving me the grid to show if I wanted to, for instance, there's breakfast included with the lodging, I would uncheck my breakfast, because you can't receive the breakfast per diem if um, the hotel provides it. And then in this case, I would enter my room rate. So it's showing me my ceiling is 115. So my hotel is only $95. Maybe the tax was 10. You know, and now it's doing that calculation for me. If there, if I was over the allowable amount, it would go ahead and kick that amount into unallowable. And then we could decide how to code it so the employee can decide or accounting can decide whether it goes to you know, an unallowable category or maybe you can get it approved because there is a convention and there's no hotels available, whatever it might be. Put in a description of the reason why. So now I click Finish, and you can see that it's created, um, it's created my per diem line for me. So you can see my lodging line, lodging tax, the first and last day's meal at 75%, you know, and then the day in the middle there um, at, the, <clears throat> at the full rate. Once I've finished it, I can go ahead and save it. If I had some type of attachment, I could attach a document. So same idea, drag and drop an attachment, and it would place it against this particular record. And then once I finish it, I would go ahead and click the Submit button. Then this is what would trigger the email out to my approver uh, to review it and approve that particular expense report. On both the time entry and the expense entry, there's also this option to enter on behalf of. So if you have an executive that has an admin, that the admin enters those time or expenses, you can leverage that from a data entry perspective. 
So once those particular documents are submitted, then there's an email that gets triggered, and then they'll go through the approval process. So to save time, I'm not going to go through the approval process today, but they would see all the documents an approver would that they need to approve. So as that time and expenses are getting entered, what you're going to see is on the expense side, in real time that data is getting processed inside the accounting system. So I'm going to go into uh, my list of expense reports, and what you're going to see is here at the bottom that trip to Orlando, it's already been submitted. I can see the details, you know, in terms of amount. If I wanted to see where it's at in the approval process, you can see that there's two approvers to my expense reports. They've received an email, but they haven't actually approved it yet, and there's no been no delegated approver on those. And then, in addition, I could pull up any type of attachments. So that's kind of how uh, expenses are going to get submitted and brought into the system. On the time entry side, what we do is the time doesn't get pulled until um, someone on the the accounting side or a payroll side actually processes it. Because what you want to do is you want to make sure that everything has been reviewed and approved before it's processed. So we go into the time journal, <clears throat> and this is the place, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> this is the place where time is going to get processed. So the first thing I'm going to do, <clears throat> pardon me, might have been a good time for a poll. I think I'm okay now. All right. So. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to first import. Actually, before you import the time, you probably want to run the missing time. So this is uh, this is the one thing that uh, you can use for two different purposes. One is you can use it for a floor check. So if the government comes in, you need to do a floor check. Say on the 28th, you can select the floor check date. Typically, you're running this for um, at the end of your timesheet period to see if anyone has not entered. Um, or approved the time yet. So you're going to run this, and then you got to chase those people down to get them to enter or approve the time. In addition, there's a daily reminder that goes out. So if I look at the timesheet set up before we do this, let me just go over and I'll show the folks on the call really quick uh, related to that timesheet setup. And what this does is this is going to trigger automated emails. So I can identify that do I send out email notifications? And if I do, when do I want to send them? So I can send them when someone submits time so the approver knows to approve it. Uh, you can send the daily reminder um, and also copy the supervisor on the daily reminder Then decide what time you want to send that daily reminder and a timesheet reminders, expense report reminders. So these are automated alerts that the system is going to trigger. Uh, we'll go back to that time journal. So we talked about running the missing time report. From there, we import the time into the system, and it creates entries um, into the journal per employee. From there, you're going to calculate the labor distribution. What that does is it calculates the per hour rate. And then from there, um, we can print our time journal summary report. And what this is going to show is all the details uh, related to the employees. So it's going to show by employee. Are they salaried or hourly? What their pay rate is? The different projects that they're charging to. So you'll see the, the history of the projects and the hours. Um, I can see the detail of what's going to hit the project when it gets posted. And then I could see from a benefit perspective and a GL perspective uh, what's going to happen when we actually post this entry. So it gives me a preview of what's going to happen before I post it. Before I post it, you can also send this data off to ADP, Paychex. We also work with payroll networks and other payroll providers. There's also a payroll system uh, built into the application. So once I do all of that review and it's acceptable, I would go ahead and post it. And at that point, it hits all those ledgers in real time. So you don't have to post it multiple times. That one post hits everything in real time. So in some systems, what you have is you've got to close those ledgers out. Uh, this is going to give you more of a real-time view of data. So now once I've, you know, I've processed those expense reports, I've processed the time, you know, the next 
step that you would go through um, and as part of your month end process, you know, you might talk about your indirects before you're going to recognize revenue and billing. So we're going to first go to our indirects and talk about how indirect rates are set up and how they're processed. Uh, then we'll go into the billing side. So within cost pools, this is the place where your indirect rate structure is going to be set up. So this is going to be as simple or as complex as your business. In my example, we've got a fringe, uh, overhead, company site, client site, G&A pool in this demo system. What happens is step one is you define the rate structure. Step two for each one of these pools, whether it's a final pool or an intermediate pool or service center, you're going to define how the rate for this pool gets calculated. So under pool, cost, and base, you're going to define which accounts you're going to use to accumulate your cost. So in this case, it's a range of my overhead accounts. And what you're doing is you're setting up um, an account. We call it an account set. So you can reuse that anytime you'd like. So in this case, my overhead account, if I go into the detail of what that includes, is it includes account 7,000 through 7,700. So this is going to be based on your chart of accounts, the range of accounts for what is in my overhead pool. Uh, the next step is once I define what's in the pool, I'm defining when those costs are accumulated. Actually, let me go back because I, we talk about the base for just a second just to mention some other concepts. So um, in this example, my base includes not only the direct labor, but it's also with the fringe applied. So what happened is step one, my fringe was an intermediate pool. So I took those fringe costs and I allocated a portion into overhead and GNA. So my, my base for my overhead pool not include, included not only labor, but also that fringe component. Your base can also be non-financial accounts. So whether it's square footage, um, it could be labor hours versus labor dollars. Uh, you can set up those different uh, bases as a statistical account in the system. Uh, and then another thing I didn't talk about was the department. So because you might have pools that are for just certain departments, you can define what departments are participating in that pool. So that's kind of the, the pool and base concept. The next step is the allocation of cost. So if it's a final pool, which means those accumulated costs go out to projects, you would just check, you know, they go out to projects. And it can be done at both an actual and a provisional rate. Um, and then if it's going into another account, it would go into another GL account to be later picked up, in that case of fringe, to be allocated um, at a later point once those costs are accumulated into my two overhead and GNA uh, pools. The next step is identifying what is the provisional rate that we're using for billing. And you can see that there can be a historical um, amounts of these. So in this case, uh, in 2013, this, the rate for that pool was 50%. Maybe in 2014, you know, now our approved provision rate was 55. And then the final rate, you know, is going to be 51. And hopefully the government approved um, that rate variance so you can actually bill it. So the system is going to be able to bill and track those variances. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is when you actually process your indirects, they get posted to the general ledger and to the project ledger, both in real time. And let me go over to my chart of accounts to show you a little bit about how that looks. <clears throat> what you're seeing is a series of allocation accounts here. I'm going to highlight two of them. So when you run that allocation process, and I'll just pull up the screen on, you can see that I can either use the menu or I can type in the menu bar. Um, if I just know the description of it, so I just type in allocate. And I would just choose the period I want to run this allocation for, and then whether I'm using the final rate or not. You can also schedule any of these. This is just a process. So whether it's a report or a process, you can schedule it to be run at any time. And then when that is posted, you can see the impact on the general ledger. So when I drill into that amount, the 37000 you're going to see the detail of all the entries that were made as part of that allocation. So every project and task um, where costs were allocated, I'll see what was in, what was the amount, 
what was the rate, what project, task, department it went to, and then I can see the total amount here in this case, a little under $4,000. So you'll be able to run things provisional versus actual, um, and then report on those variances very easily. <clears throat> so that's one step of the month-end process. Another key step in your month-end process is the invoicing process. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll pull up a project and walk you through the process for invoicing. So the steps you're going to do is I'm going to run this function to create an invoice. You're going to choose projects you want to run it for. This whole idea of billing group, these are the different, if you remember earlier, we had all the different tasks on there. I can choose if it's one or multiple tasks that get billed on this particular invoice. What is the period I'm going to run it for, whether I'm using the final rate or not, and what is the final rate period from. I say OK, and what it does is it creates an invoice proposal or worksheet. So this is the place that you're going to go to review the invoice, make sure it's accurate before you process it. So we'll go ahead and print it. Um, there's different selections on how you want to group this. So things, you know, do you want to sort it by task? Do you want to show, you know, payment office, billing periods? How do you want to group the thing? So in this case, is it by resource or labor category on the labor side? We'll go ahead and preview it. And now what you're seeing is, obviously it would be your logo, not our logo on the invoice. You know, information about the bill to data, primary contract number, information about funding, not only the amount, but what's left and what the funded fee was, if it's funded, if there's a, a fee amount that's funded. And then you'll see a breakout, you know, your direct labor, subcontractors, uh, indirects. You, know, you can see what the percentage of the indirects is and also the fee. And then we've got a total for that task. And that's going to go to each subsequent task. So each one of these invoices, it's just a report. So I can export it out to Excel, PDF, or Word. Once you've reviewed it, you might want to send it for additional approval. So this approval request will send an email off. Uh, so then your project manager can review it and accept it if needed. So now once I've gone through that process and once it's completed and it's completely acceptable, I'll hit post. <clears throat> and what it does, it creates a posted invoice, which is going to be your final invoice document. You can reprint this thing as many times as you want. So you can see I printed this one a couple times already. If I wanted to reprint it, I just go ahead and hit the print button um, and we go ahead and preview it. So if I want to see it instead of by resource, by labor category. We'll just preview it and show it a different way so you can see a little different take on it. So now what you're going to see is down in the labor section, it's no longer showing the person's name. It's just showing their labor category. So you've got a lot of flexibility there. Uh, you can also save those. So once you decide for this project, this is the way I want to see it. There's something called it's an invoice selection in a way that you can save it. You can also email. Uh, the invoice. So if I want to email this as a PDF, I could email it uh, right out of the system uh, to my client um, so they can get that, uh, that final copy. In addition um, to uh, formats within Microsoft Dynamics, uh, there's also options that are government-specific formats. So whether you're uh, looking at the 1034 and 1035 or DD250, you can leverage those formats. And what that's going to do is actually drop it onto the government form. So um, if you use that public voucher to invoice, you can leverage that function. So I know, Damon, we've got, uh, I guess, another one more poll um, before we get to the last couple steps to close things out today. Sure. And one of the things we've talked about is you know, a lot of different <coughs> things with our system, the reporting, the automation, obviously compliance and integration. Kind of curious for the folks on the line, what are the most important aspects that they're looking for within their organization to improve? Um, you know, are you, are you, you know, how is the reporting coming, the automation? Um, obviously, a lot of government contractors want to make sure that they're compliant. Uh, integration is always uh, very important with a lot of our customers who use Project or Word or SharePoint. Um, so definitely want to take care of that. It looks like a lot of folks are looking at the automation and reporting. All right. Yeah, we'll just give it just a couple more seconds to, and it looks like we're all right. 
it looks like about 95 percent have voted and uh, number one is automations automations at 58 percent uh, we've got reporting at 27 percent uh, compliance at 14 percent and a couple percent on the integration and other side so that's often what we see is that uh, automation reporting and compliance are probably <clears throat> the top three pieces for what companies are looking for from an overall improvement perspective all right so um, last thing we want to do to uh, close this thing down is we're going to uh, spend a few minutes to take any questions that uh, folks on the on the call might have and um, again you can post those into the question area. All right, so it looks like uh, we've got a handful of questions on here, Damon. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to take a few of these questions. Uh, I guess the, the first question, and it's been asked a couple different times on here, is related to uh, what size organization is the best fit for this application? And <clears throat> Actually, that's one of the unique things about the system is that it's actually um, leveraged by a wide range of companies. So on the low end, I'd say we've got clients that start off with us probably when they're about uh, 40 to 50 employees, uh, and then we've got clients that are several thousand employees. So from a revenue perspective, usually between 10 million to about a billion in revenue. And I'd say one of the reasons is because of the fact that the system you know, has that ease of use, but it's got the power to it uh, to really meet expanding needs. Uh, second question on here, uh, there's a question regarding reporting. So the question was, what is the report writer that's being used for the system? So let me just actually, I'm going to show you a couple things on reporting um, before we answer the last few questions that are in the queue. So from a reporting perspective, what you have is, there is a financial report writer uh, built into the system. It's called account schedules. And that account schedules, um, it's, it's not crystal reports. It's a uh, report writer that's built into NAV. And one of the things that makes it unique because of that is just like when we drill down to the chart of accounts, you can actually drill down into a financial report. So you can drill down and get the answer. So this is, I, I would call it proprietary to Dynamics NAV. So it's called account schedules. It's the financial report writer. And then reporting services is the report writer for each of the modules. And then we leverage analysis services, if folks remembered, for uh, that data cube technology. So that's what these dashboards are built in um, is analysis services on the data cube side. So those are the three places um, for that. Uh, Okay, the, there's another question here in terms of actually two questions that are similar, so I'm just going to answer it in general. Um, but it's about how do we get access to the full application? Um, is it only client server based or can you access it via a browser? <clears throat> so NAV, there's three ways to access it. You can access it via what I'm using right here, which is a client loaded on my local machine. There's also a browser based option. So very similar capabilities, but there's no software loaded on your machine. And the third option is related to uh, SharePoint. So you could actually have, there's a SharePoint client um, for logging in. So any one of those three are an option. I'd say for heavy data entry users, the, the full client is probably the one that's leveraged the most um, for typically the accounting team, but you can use the browser one if needed. <coughs> All right, and now we have three questions regarding implementation um, related to time frame and cost. And this one is difficult because, like I mentioned, there's such a wide range of users um, that it can range anywhere from on the, the shorter time frame, 60 to 90 days. I'd say that 90 to 120 is typical, um, but we've had clients that are you know, like I mentioned, a billion-dollar business. So those are much longer projects, and they're they're more uh, expensive. There's more of an investment there. So what we'll do is, for the folks that uh, requested information about cost, we'll just follow up with you, and we just get some basic information, 
and we can let you know how it, you know, the license cost. But I guess one question regarding the license is that um, it's based on concurrent users. So on the timesheet side, you get unlimited use, um, time and expense, and then you get um, it's based on concurrent users inside the application. <clears throat> so I think that covers most of the questions, and I, I think we've got about a minute left. So I oh. believe that's it. So I'm going to take back over and. Um, we answer the Q's and A's. I do want to thank everyone for joining us. So we, we did run out of time. And uh, there's a couple questions here. We definitely get to those um, one on one. We'll be sure to get reached out to you. Again, if you have any questions that come up afterwards, feel free to reach out to either Paul or myself. You should have our emails. Um, and there's also our contact information here on the last page. And uh, we hope to uh, talk to everyone soon. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.